Colossians chapter number 3, verses 3 and 4. Colossians chapter number 3, verses 3 and 4. Found your place, say amen. amen. For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. We live in a world today where there are people who totally reject a fact. I mean, they challenge the facts. They try to change the facts. Up's no longer up. Down's no longer down. I mean, they just straight out reject a fact. The unfortunate thing about this is that mentality has crept its way into the church of the Lord Jesus. And now we have Christians who will not receive a fact. They'll not take it as a fact. When I was pastoring the last church I pastored, I used to get up on Wednesday night and tell the church I was going to make a statement that you probably never heard. I was going to back it up with the King James Bible. And if you could find in the King James Bible where I was wrong, prove me wrong not on what you thought, not on how you felt, not on what Dr. So and so said, but what this book said, I would stand up on Sunday morning, I would admit my mistake, I would apologize because Sidney Weaver is not always right, but this King James Bible is always right. When the world around us and in the church in which we uh, serve, I have found out that too many people rely on their feelings what they feel how they feel I got news for you you can never trust your feelings because they will change faster than you can get a hold of you can never trust your feelings hang on I'm going to say something you might not ever heard but sometimes you can't trust your faith your faith will fail you. Your faith will let you down. Your faith will be almost non-existent. So if you cannot rely on your faith and you cannot ever trust your feelings, what in the world can we lean on? What in the world can we trust? I got good news for you. You can always trust the facts. The facts are the facts. Paul is writing to the church at Colossae. And in this third chapter and these two verses... I believe that he gives us the facts of the Christian life. Too many of us believe the Bible on how we feel. Or we believe the Bible because of our faith, what we believe. But tonight, we're just going to look at the facts of the Christian life. We're just going to let the facts, God help us, to let the facts be the facts. And here in these two verses, I find the facts of the Christian life. Now, stay with me. You're going to hear, maybe hear some things you may have heard, you may not have heard, but they are the facts. Paul begins in verse number three, and he says, for ye are dead. Wait just a minute. In verse number one, he said, if ye then be risen with Christ, he no doubt is talking to us who were dead in trespasses and in sin and have been birthed to new life. He's talking to Christians. He's talking to us who are born again, resurrected if you will, from the dead and then he turns around in verse number 3 and he says for ye that same ye there is the same ye in verse number 1 when he said if you've then been risen so now I've been resurrected to life but I'm dead yeah. Yeah. My daughter came to me one time and said, Daddy, you've been preaching too young. She said, you've been preaching that I was brought to new life, that I'd passed from death unto life, and now you say that I'm dead. How can I be dead? I turned to Colossians 3, 3, opened it up, and said, for ye are dead. She said, close your Bible. That's good enough for me if I never understand it. What we don't understand is that we have a separated, as Christians, we have a separated life. Death in the Bible never means annihilation it always means separation and if you've been born again if you've been washed in the blood you have been separated I believe Paul is talking here to us that are saved and reminding us that we are dead to sin we are dead to the penalty of sin do you know that Jesus will never remind me of my sin that God at judgment will never bring up my sin I'm glad that the blood of Jesus Christ God 
God's Son cleanseth us from all. I said it cleanseth us from all. I said a double L all of our sin. And I am clean. I am separated from the penalty of sin. Here's the one that Christians, we shout on that one, but we can't get a hold of this one. We just don't feel like it's exactly right. We just don't believe it's exactly right but we're not only separated from the penalty of sin we are separated from the power of sin now I want to just go ahead and tell you the devil can't make you do it if you're a child of God because he separated you I'm going to pick on you brother put your stuff down I'm going to pick on you a minute this man's going to represent a lost man stand up I want you to see this now, you know the Bible said the old man's dead He's not annihilated. He's separated. When I was a lost man, he's representing me as a lost man. I said on Friday, I'm going to go home and do right. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do. I'm going to be good to my wife. I'm going to do good by my children. I'm going to buy them something. I ain't going to gamble my money away. Some of you know what I'm talking about. You may have left a Friday and cashed your check, went straight to a bar, went straight to somewhere, and you say, I'm not going to do that this week. And you start toward home, and sin had a grip on you. Sin had power over you. And said, no, we're going to the bar. You couldn't help yourself. You were the servant of sin but thank God that morning when I nailed in an old fashioned altar and got birthed into the family of God got brought into new life God came along and I'm going to use a Bible word he circumcised the old man away he separated that old man now he didn't annihilate him that booger's still there saying we ought to go back we ought to go do what we used to do oh, wasn't it a lot of fun when we used to do this but he can't make me see it he can't make me do it he can't make my sin has no power Hour, thank you sir in my life because I have been separated I am now living a separated life too many of us going by our feelings because we feel defeated doesn't change the fact because we feel like the devil's winning doesn't change the fact because we feel like sin and the old man is so powerful still in our lives it doesn't change the fact that the old man is separated he's not annihilated I'm still a wrestling with him every day he's still a whispering in my ear but it cannot make me do it it has no power over me I am a born again blood washed child of the living God and the fact is that sin is penalty I'm free from the penalty of sin I'm free from the power of sin and one of these glad days hallelujah I'm going to be free from the very presence of sin the facts are the facts no matter how you feel no matter what you believe the devil cannot make you do it sin cannot reign in your mortal body that's why Paul said to Romans to reckon ourselves dead to sin and alive to God. If we'd ever understand who we are in Jesus Christ, we would not be praying for revival. I believe we'd be enjoying revival. The problem is we don't know who we are. We don't feel like that's who we are. We don't believe that's who we are. But God cut away sin out of our life. He killed and now not annihilated but separated the old man from our life and now I live a separated life that's why I can say no to things I don't want that's why I, the things I want are now different praise God I'm glad the things I used to want I don't even want them anymore I'm glad that the pull of the world has no power over me when I was a sinner lost I couldn't tell sin no but now that's easy it's easy in the power of the Holy Ghost to say no I live a separated life he said you are dead remember that's a separation not a lie I'll give you an example James said that when the spirit leaves the body you're dead. When the spirit separates from the body, that's death. It's always separation. Our souls, uh, that man on the inside, he never dies. It's called the second death when hell and all are cast in the lake of fire, but they never annihilate it. It is a second death. It is a second separation. Death is always separation in the Bible. We are living a separated life. Let's move on. He said, for you are dead and your life is, is, I got that underlined in my Bible, is. That is a positive 
present tense word. It's a fact right now. It may not feel like a fact. You may not be able to believe it's a fact, but ye, your life is hid with Christ in God. No longer am I living a separated life. Hallelujah. I'm living a secure life. Now I don't have the time or all the knowledge to go into the depths of what it means, so I'll make it real plain. For ye are hid. Your life is hid. Now the devil knows Knows your address. Uh, every little devil out of hell and all his imps, they know where you work. They know where you go to church. They know where you go to school. How in the world am I hid? I'm glad you asked me that because I got a good story for it. As you know, I grew up as a policeman's son. My parents divorced when I was about 14 years old and me and my mom and oldest sister, we moved into government subsidized housing as a real governmental way of saying the projects based on your income we, mama didn't make a lot of money so we didn't have a lot of rent we moved into these apartments and my back door went out right to the park and the steps that went up to the park that's where all us teenagers would meet well I've always been an early riser I woke up one Saturday morning early I got ready I went out there sitting on the steps waiting on all my friends to come out there and meet me at the steps at those steps I could look down the sidewalk to both of the roads that ran beside our apartments and I looked and saw a guy coming the closer he got I know, noticed that that guy had been on something not just drinking he had been on something because the closer he got I noticed his hair <coughs> looked like he'd stuck his finger in a light socket the closer he got his eyes was a bulging out they were red I mean his face is glowing he was I mean we call it where I'm from please forgive me we call it he's jacked up on something and I mean the way he was walking and he is looking I was sitting on them steps and when he got real close I recognized who he was and as he started by me he looked at me and he looked at me again and then he finally stopped and turned around and he's staring at me there's a big old 55 gallon drum sitting there and uh, it had wine bottles packed up some of y'all remember that old cheap wine bottles there's a the bottles were so thick you could slam them on the cement and they wouldn't bust. I reached over and got the neck of one of them bottles and I turned my shoulder back. I remember saying, Lord, please help me because I'm fixing to split this idiot's head wide open. He's just staring at me. Then he said, I bet I know you. He asked me, do I know you? Well, my parents had just divorced. I'm the new man of the house. So in my most manly voice, I said, no, no, sir. <laughs> he said yeah I know you I may not be able to call your first name but I know your last name cause I know who your daddy is and you look just like your daddy I said you do he said I do said your daddy's Richard Weaver he has arrested me two dozen times and two dozen times I have resisted arrest and your daddy has overpowered me and put me in jail he said I owe your daddy a good whooping and I could give you a good whooping I slid down one step and loaded that bottle up. Now, I was, listen, I wasn't playing no Billy Bad. I was going to split his skull open, run in that back door, double lock it, get that 12 gauge shotgun, rack that pump shotgun, and pray he didn't kick that door open and I had to shoot him. But I loaded that bottle up. He said, Yeah, I owe your daddy a good whooping. Oh, I could give you one today and tell you to give it to your daddy. I said, You could. He said, Yeah. Then he started laughing. He said, but uh, you won't need that bottle, little Richard. You won't need to get all pumped up and bowed up. He said, because I ain't going to put my hands on you, and I ain't going to threaten you. I'm not going to do anything to you. Don't even tell your daddy I spoke to you. I said, why not? He said, because uh, if your daddy didn't get too rough with me when he arrested me them 20-something times. But if I lay my hands on his son, if I touch his boy, I'm telling you there ain't no telling what he'd do to me when he got me. If you wasn't Richard Weaver's boy, I'd probably get you. But because I know who your daddy is, and I'm here to tell some child of God tonight that the devil may be a stalking you, he may be a whispering in your ear, but he can't lay a hand on you. The reason some of you ain't bankrupt, the reason some of you ain't already went under, the reason we ain't a waving the white flag and giving up is God. 
God doesn't have to sneak us away and hide us. Hallelujah. He can hide us right in the very car door of hell because that devil's going to look at us who are really born again. And when he looks at us, he knows who our daddy is. And he knows if he puts a hand on me, he's got to touch, he's got to answer to, he's got to stand up in front of my daddy. I'm glad I serve a God who can hide you right in plain sight. They know where I live. They know where I'm traveling. No doubt the devil's tried to run me off the road. He tried to cause a collision. But I'm glad that my God took my life and hid it, hallelujah, right in plain sight. I'm talking about the protection of a secure life. Every once in a while, some of you ought to go up to the de uh, devil and just stick your tongue out and say, I did double dog dare you to put your hands on me. I remember riding with my daddy in the police car. The laws wasn't like they are now. We just ride around. Where I'm from, we didn't have any bars or nightclubs or sports bar. We didn't have we didn't have anything but beer joints. We and him was riding one Friday night and they come on and called all the people, all the police, all points bulletin, every officer available. There's a big melee going on in the parking lot at one of them beer joints. My daddy looked over, told me, said, roll that window up. Now you young folk have to Google this. But there's a time when you didn't roll a window up by pushing a button. You did like this with a handle. And I started rolling that window up. And when I got it rolled up, he was already had that big uh, interceptor engine in the wind. He said, lock that door. Believe this or not, you didn't push a button to lock the door. You pushed the toggle down. Matter of fact, I'm old enough to remember when you had to have two keys for a vehicle. One opened the door and the other one started the car up. But anyway, I locked that door. My daddy started rolling his window up. We was running fast as we go. And he said, what I'm going to do is there ain't but one driveway leads into that place and one leads out. He said, I'm going to slide that car in there sideways and block that driveway on the driver's side. I'm going to step out and lock this door behind me. When I shut that door, he said, I'm going to pull out my blackjack. I'm going to wade up. I ain't going to leave that driveway, but I'm going to wade up in there and I'm going to start making arrests and fighting. And I said, Daddy, what if they get to me? They'll see me sitting here in the car. He said, just keep the doors locked and remember, if they're going to get to you, they got to come through me. He slid that car up there and stepped out. I know I had him get up and walk out on me telling this story last week, but it'll be all right. I, uh, this was a different time. This was in the early 80s. My daddy kicked that door open, stepped out, slammed that door. I reached over there and made sure it was locked. It was locked. My daddy locked it. Your life is right now hid. God already locked the door. You ain't got to go check it. My daddy locked that door, stepped out, pulled that old, we call them head patches. It's a spring with a steel ball on the end uh, wrapped in leather. He waded up on that driveway. He started knocking heads and throwing people down and kicking them here and arresting them. I mean, he's doing such a good job. Uh, I wasn't scared anymore. I wasn't worried about anybody getting me anymore. I remember leaning over and cracking the window about that much and yelling out, you're doing a good job, Daddy. Get them, Daddy. I'm proud of you, Daddy. And I came to Florence, Kentucky tonight to tell somebody, roll the window down and tell the Lord, you've been doing a good job protecting me. You've been looking out for me. I'm not going to be afraid because I'm locked in and my life is hid. Hallelujah. It's here. My life is hid. Not only do I see I'm living a secure life because of the protection, I'm living a secure life because of the protector. What's this? My life is hid with Christ. What a... You want to talk about being exalted. You want to talk about being promoted. You want to talk about being lived. Now, that may not mean a lot to you, but I was born on the wrong side of the tracks. I was born on the poor white trash side of town. I was born next to, I live next to a Presbyterian church. They never one time knocked on the door and invited us to come. They didn't want our kind at it. No, the Jehovah Witnesses and the Mormons wouldn't even come visit in that neighborhood I lived in. And when my, my first girlfriend, I tell you, my wife was here, my first puppy love girlfriend was in the church uh, that I attended. 
And when her mama found out we was talking, her mama set her down, a saint of God. Her, the, her mama's a, still alive, saint of God. She set that girl down and said, you leave that Sidney Weaver alone. His daddy is no good. He's no good. The family's no good. You'll never get anything from him. He'll never be anything. He'll never amount to anything. He'll never have anything. The best thing for you to do is leave him alone. And she was exactly right. The only thing she didn't know is that God was going to step over in the poor white trash neighborhood, come over on the other side of the tracks, and reach down and take a no account, low down, hell deserving sinner who was going, had nothing, going nowhere, never going to be anybody and save him and put me with his only begotten son. You hold your head down if you want to. You can pour mouth and whine about being a child of God but I'm a squaring my shoulders back. I'm a holding my head up. God, I don't know why he loved me like he loved me. I don't know why he thought it would be worth it but he took a no account piece of trash and put him with his son. He said my life is hid with Christ. Hallelujah. We in this thing together. Glory to God. I don't know if that's a helping you, but it's a helping me tonight to know. I'm going to just go ahead and make somebody mad. Oh, you one of them preachers that think you Christians or somebody, you are guilty. You better believe I do. Facts are the facts. If you're a child of God, born again, blood washed, and you die, where do you go? If you're not and you die, where do you go? God thought we was pretty special. Gonna share his home with us, build us a city, praise God. You can pour them out, hang your head down, say, woe is me, I'm just a Christian. I'm just, you can do what you want to. But if you ever realize what the facts are, that God has elevated you. Matter of fact, Paul said, I wanted to preach this tonight. Paul said in Ephesians chapter one, that he hath. Now I'm not a smart on the English language, but my wife's a certified school teacher. And hath is a past tense word already done. He hath raised us up together and may hath made us past tense set together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus I was at the Dollar General a couple weeks ago and a, a fellow that I used to commit sin with and we used to shoot a little pool now if he is here tonight he'd stand up and tell you that he beat me but I'm telling you that ain't exactly how it will happen he's not remembering it exactly right but he hollered at me across the Dollar General as I went by, I didn't see him. He said, hey, Ralph. I stepped back and saw who it was. I said, what's up, my brother? And he said, how you doing? I said, if I was any better, I couldn't stand it. Living in paradise. His eyes got big. He said, you call what we living in, in paradise? I said, oh, no, no. But when God saved me, he moved the whole kingdom down on the inside of me. And I don't spend all my time living on Fox News. And I don't spend all my time listening to politicians and watching the stock market. Hallelujah. I spend a lot of my time living in here in the kingdom. I'm enjoying being in the kingdom. Glory to God. I'm living in paradise. It may not be paradise out there where you're living, sir, but it's paradise down on the inside of me. And I'm having myself a time. I'm not apologizing for it. I was raised in one of them independent fundamental King James Bible believing King James only. Churches walk right, keep it tight, spit white and drink pride. I mean our pastor pointed his finger, preached an iron and a half, walk on the pews. Everything was a sin. Everything we teenagers done was wrong. But I ain't mad about it. I ain't recovering from it. I ain't trying to candy man it, mix it all with love till it all tastes good. Hallelujah. I'm being who God said I am I'm not who some preacher said I am I'm not who the devil said I am I'm not even who I think I am glory to God let the facts be the facts and be who God made us raised us together said my life is hid with Christ in God now if that ain't secure enough I ain't got any remedy for you it's hid with Christ in God that's pretty tight. That's pretty secure. We as God's people are not only living a separated life, we're living a, a secure life. Let me give you one more and I'm finished. He said in verse number four, when Christ, 
<laughs> that word when gives the, uh, uh, lets, uh, the, the idea, it actually gives the assurance that that day is coming. There's no doubt about it. Paul didn't have a doubt if, but he said when Christ. Now what's this uh, comma? Who is our life shall appear. Then shall ye also appear with him in glory. We not only have a separated life, we not only have a secure life, but we have a superior life. Watch this, I'll handle it. I want you to see the reality of our superior life. He said when Christ, we'll come back to that. Here's the reality. Who is, that's present tense positive, right now. Who is right now our life? Buckle up, this is the part some of you won't like. Your job, sir, is not your life. I'm talking about if you've been risen with Christ. Your job is not your life. Your hobby is not your life. Oh, buckle up real tight. Pull her real tight. Grandmama, them grandkids are not your life. Your children are not your life. Everybody has that kind of life. But Christ has moved us up higher. He has made our superior to what everybody else has. Christ who is our life. He is our life because all life, our life comes from him. It is God who gave me this life. I was dead in trespasses and in sin, but he brought me to new life. Matter of fact, let me tell you, I have everlasting life. John 3, 16 says, that whosoever believeth in him shall have everlasting life. Everlasting life is life that has a beginning. I was sitting six pews back on the preacher's right hand side. I wouldn't listen to a word the preacher said. Didn't go that morning looking for God. All of a sudden sitting right in the middle of that six pew, the Holy Ghost came where I was, pulled the blinders off my eyes, showed me who Jesus was. I, they didn't sing 16 stanzas of just as I am. Didn't nobody get me to raise my hand play some kind of game. I, nobody came down there and said I believe God's dealing with you my man of God was three quarters away back the center aisle standing in a pew he had his one foot on the back of the pew one foot where he's sitting in the pew he had both of them long three foot long fingers pointed out he was roaring like a lion hair was hanging down his face I was just waiting on him to say shake hands and be friendly that's how he closed every service and I was waiting on that and all of a sudden the Holy Ghost showed up I popped up like a jack in the box kicked pocketbooks out of the way stepped over the was grabbing at my clothes. They didn't know what I was doing. Made my way to an old fashioned altar. This won't go in this new ecumenical recovering fundamental candy man Christianity we have today. But I knelt that morning in repentance and faith and God, the Holy Ghost birthed me into the family of God. And the moment I believed, I received everlasting life. And from that moment, I shall never die. I shall live forever and forever. John 3 15 says that he gave us eternal life everlasting life has a beginning and no end eternal life has no beginning and no end eternal life is the very life of God he not only gave his life for me he gave his life to me so he is my life. He paid for me. He bought me. He purchased me with his own blood and gave his life as a ransom for me. But then he gave me his life. Now you may not see it. You may not even know it. But I have eternal life. I can't explain all that. But I quit trying to explain God a long time ago and started to enjoy what God done for me, who God made me. I tell you, we ought to clean off a place every once in a while and quit waiting on God to do something and shout about and just shout about who God is he is hallelujah he would have been God to let every one of us go to hell and fry like a meat skin but he couldn't sit idly by and not only had been enough just to save us and stick us in a paradise it had been just enough to save us and let us live a halfway decent life but he gave his life for us and then he gave his life to us and I have the very life of God down on the inside of me he is my life that's why I give up on everything else that's why I turn my back on everything else because it is not my life he is my life it's a superior life the reality it's not only from him but our life is for him 
I'll just give you this verse. Whatsoever you do, do it heartily as under the Lord. Sometimes we get the idea that the pastor or the full-time evangelist is the only one in full-time Christian work. But if you've been saved, you're in full-time Christian service. Everything you do. If you drive a truck, you ought to drive it for the, whole, uh, for the Lord Jesus. You ought to give it everything you got. If you stay at home and raise your children and change diapers and wash clothes and wash this, it'll help you if you realize I'm going to do this for the Lord. My daddy was never a spiritual man about two years before he died. But he used to tell me things that make good spiritual application. He used to say, son, whatever you're going to be, be the best at it you can be. Stay at it till you're the best. And his favorite illustration was, if you're going to be a ditch digger, somebody says, we'll bring one of them ditch witches and dig. Say, no, you ain't seen Sydney operate that shovel. You wait till you see this boy dig a ditch. Whatever it is that you do, you, if you get to doing it for him, you won't do it halfway. You won't be satisfied to just get by. You'll be the best employee the man's got when you realize you're not working for that plant. You're not working for that boss man. You're not working for that crew, but you're working for him because all of my life is from him and all of my life is for him. That's a superior life. Most people have no purpose for getting up in the morning. They're just trying to make it through another day. I bounce out of the bed, hallelujah, looking for what God has for me to do each day. It is a superior life in its reality. It is a superior life in its revelation. Here we go. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall, <coughs> then shall ye also appear same ye then ye also appear with him in glory now I actually believe that Paul is referencing when Jesus comes to take up to set up his kingdom but I would be remiss to pass by this I've been called a heretic for this but I believe the Bible teaches it and the facts are the facts that one of these glad mornings a trumpet's going to sound so loud that it'll wake the dead and, I, and I'm going to bust some bubbles on what you think here and you can disagree with me if you want to because you think we're all going to get caught up in a moment in the twinkling of an eye but the text says that you shall be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye doesn't say that we'd be caught up in a moment, it's winking at I. I used to tell them when I passed their Blessed Hope, our fellowship hall window looked right out the graveyard. I'd stand there a minute and say, what are you doing, preacher? I said, I'd just wait and see if trumpet's going to sound because I want to watch them graves bust open and them saints of God come flying out because Paul said we wouldn't go in before them. We will not prevent them which are asleep. They'll come up first. Then we shall be changed. First Corinthians, he said that we'll be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. I don't think it's going to happen so fast we ain't going to get to enjoy it hallelujah God didn't save us for just a passing by faith or a passing by moment I believe that we'll know what's going on and we'll get to enjoy it but one of these days the trumpet's going to sound so loud the Lord's going to send to the clouds we with the corruption shall put on incorruption the mortal shall put on immortality and then we'll be caught up together in the clouds to meet with the Lord and so shall we ever be with the Lord I believe it's about seven years later can can you imagine trying to preach this in the 1800s when you got to that part where it said and every eye shall see him how did they describe that we know now with satellites and news links and all that can you imagine one day they're watching TV all of a sudden CNN comes on and says we don't know what's going on but over there on the eastern side up in the skies a man with nail prints in his hand he's glowing like the sun his feet are like fine brass tried in the fire on his head are many crowns his robe has been dipped in blood he's sitting on a white battle stand you say I just don't believe that believe what you want to the facts are the facts he's going to ride out of heaven on a white battle stand my favorite part is he's bringing the armies plural with him hallelujah I'll be the one as close as I can get behind him cheesing real big on the way back guess where he's coming back to he's coming back right where he fell from the man of 
Olives. He is on the Mount of Olives when he ascended into heaven. He's coming right back to the Mount of Olives. Steps off that battle stallion, that mountain to cleave into. He'll walk right across the Kidron Valley, right through the eastern gate. He'll sit down on his father David's throne and rule for a thousand years. But when he appears in glory, the Bible said that he had on his head many crowns, a name written in his thigh, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. John saw him in all his glory and he said when he shall appear in glory ye that same ye in verse 1 that got birth to new life that same ye in verse 3 that are dead from the penalty and from the, uh, 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 the from the power of sin that same ye they, hey I can circle that and write Sidney Weaver right there glory to God when he appears in glory we shall also appear with him not in his old frail bodies not in these bodies where the spirit's willing and the flesh is weak, but in a body fashioned after his body. Hallelujah, what a day. You won't talk about a superior life. You can spend all your time. I got to hit this because I'm an independent preacher. We was coming to church this morning. We was leaving the motel room, and there's a drop in the bu uh, bat bags. And there's a drop in the gloves. And they live for travel ball somebody said we gotta quit we gotta get our kids watching these new Disney movies it's gonna ruin our kids about church too late travel ball took care of that 20 years ago yeah amen but they're caught up in travel ball one of the best families I ever pastored I lost them to travel ball one of the best families caught up in travel ball he said what you caught up in preacher I'm caught up in a different type of life bigger than any ball game bigger than any tournament bigger than anything this world has I have a superior life and when you quit feeling like you're missing out on something when you stop believing what the world's telling you and the flesh is telling you and the devil's whispering in your ear and say I may not feel it and at times I may not be able to believe it but I'm just going to embrace the facts and ride them facts all the way to the house you'll find out it's a whole lot better life it is superior the facts of the Christian life now I'll give you this and I'm finished you're going to live by your feelings you're going to trust your faith and only be able to serve God when you can believe it or you're going to just let the facts be the facts and even when you don't feel like it when you don't know and can't get a grip on it you're just going to serve God anyway the facts are the facts let's bow for prayer father Thank you for the preaching uh, opportunity. Thank you for the word of God. Thank you for the truth of your word. Now I pray that we learn who we are and what we have in Christ Jesus. May we not go by our feelings. May we not get sidetracked when our faith is faulty. But oh God, may we just learn this book and hold on to the facts. Grant it to be so, I pray for Jesus' sake. Did you know that you could receive a daily devotion every morning in your inbox? Head on over to ibcflorence.com and click on Daily Devotions to sign up today. And as always, thanks for listening.